Hi, welcome. Uh, it's Paul here from the Wine Cellar Company. We're at now our first stop on our wine tour. We've just come to Farnsell Vineyard down here in Canterbury and we can't wait to look at the uh, vines and actually taste the wine. So I'm going to go and see Phil, who's the proprietor over here, and we're going to have a little taste and chat about the history of this place. So uh, see you in a tick. Okay, hi, right, we're here. Um, Place. Fantastic wine. Um, just had a first of all taste of this and it is beautiful. I'm here with uh, Bill Hello. who grows, makes and does everything to do with this wine and uh, we're going to have a little chat um, any second now and you can tell us a little bit of history Bill, you, of what's going on down here. We, we probably picked the most perfect day to have a chat with Phil about his fantastic wines, um, especially on our first one anyway. So uh, uh, do recommend this as we go ahead, okay? And we're, uh, we'll post this everywhere. So uh, we'll see you in two seconds and we'll have a little chat around the vineyards. You on? So uh, here we are, Phil, um, lovely to meet you. <laughs> It's been absolutely a pleasure coming down here, especially for our first little tour. Um, now, it's a fabulous day. I can see the grapes are coming on well. So what's the history behind all of this? Where did you start? And, you okay, know. so my wife and I met in West London and um, we uh, took a one-way ticket to the other side of the world to see what uh, fortune we could make. Yeah. And we skied in New Zealand, walked around New Zealand and then fell into working on a vineyard 25 years ago. And uh, at that time, I had no idea you could be a winemaker. Right. But after three yeah. days, the penny dropped. So we floated with the wind for a few years, yeah. and then we came back to London and decided that I'd train to be a winemaker. So I studied at a place called Plumpton, the only place you can study to be a winemaker. Yeah. And I studied to learn the viticultural side yeah. and the winemaking side. Yeah. And then we set about trying to buy land, which isn't easy. And then one fine day, we drove purely by chance past this hedge out there. Oh, there's a vineyard. So we turned around and we came in about 15 years ago. I met the two, two brothers, right, Dr. Okay. John and his brother, Adam. Yeah. And we kept in touch with them because we could see they were getting on a little bit. And what we liked about this vineyard was a gate, a car park, some vines, a winery and spare land at the back. And what we wanted to do was plant Chardonnay and Pinot Noir because our dream was to make a classic sparkling wine. Yeah. And as the years went by, they got a little older. We then we on a, on a conversation one day in a gentleman's handshake, we acquired the vineyard. And in 2013, we planted our Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And become all yours. Yeah. yeah. Years later, we managed yeah. to harvest the grapes, press them, ferment them, bottle age them, yeah. and, la and last month we released this classic sparkling wine. 25 years in the making, a dream realised. So, we were chatting earlier on, Phil, uh, and you're telling me all about how this gets together yep. and what's special about this wine mm. and what you do here. Mm. So, if you can explain, you know, what you said to us earlier on, you know, the part what gets this makes you special, okay. you know, to everything else that's going on. So loads of people uh, uh, take into making sparkling wine and uh, a lot of people will draw comparisons with champagne. Mm. Um, I don't. What I do is champion Englishness. You could not make sparkling wine anywhere in the world before an Englishman invented glass hard enough to take the pressure. And he was a man from Kent. Really? Captain Definitely Digby. Like wow. And he was chatting, chatting to a chap called Merritt at the Royal Geographic Society yeah. who first fought to put his wine into Digby's hard English glass with some molasses at the time to ferment. So this is an English process and I'm proud that we are the home of, of sparkling wine. You know, I never knew um, that it all started with us. 35 English, years before it was attributed to Don Perignon. Yeah, and the French are probably, you know, Four champagne houses Not here now. Ever since that day. No, <laughs> no, 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 now Monsieur, Monsieur Tatinger up yeah. the road here, uh, he's exactly, now yeah, champ chance. championing us as the home of sparkling wine. I've noticed so, they've just bought some, some land up, up the road. They have, yeah, they've they just announced yeah. they're building a winery. Yeah. But here we planted Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Those varieties are important because of the proteins in the juice. Yeah. That's what gives you a fine bubble years down the line. Right. And we planted those grapes in 2013. Now my style, a preferred style of winemaking is not to interfere with what nature provides. Mm. So most um, uh, bigger wineries, the winemaker's job is to make the wine the same every year. They want your brand experience to be yeah. the same time after time. We don't. On a beautiful day like today, we can hear the wine beer made and we wait until the, uh, the grapes have matured. Only then do we decide what kind of wine we can make. 
So it's really, really organic in its way. Well, really it's organic in the sense is. that we're letting nature speak yes, to us. I mean. Nature's yeah, directing yeah. what yeah. we do. Not, a pro and not processed as such. No, yeah. no. Yeah. And we handpick the grapes, and we're obviously picking for clean grapes, yeah. nice and. Yeah. And um, 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 and when we we, we it was a field blend of 80% Pinot Noir, 20% Chardonnay. So when we press, we've got a light, slight hue from the Pinot Noir skins. Now you can act to take that out with an intervention, but my style is non-intervention. Yeah. So we didn't. And we didn't filter, um, and we just aged it in the bottle for three years before taking the yeast out. Mm. So it's been aged for you before we release. So hence that beautiful colour. Hence the beautiful slight hue of pink. Yeah. yeah. It is beautiful. Now that's neither clear nor is it rosé, but that's the way nature provided, yeah. and that's the way it stays. I must admit, it is, it is fabulous stuff. And uh, I recommend anyone to just pop themselves down here, wherever you are in the UK, especially if you're in Kent, obviously, and it's on our backyard. You know, I, we live up in Maystone, uh, the company comes from Maystone, and I haven't heard, you know, it's only the past few weeks that I've found more about yourselves, you know, mm. than down here. And this is the whole point of our tour, is to really get to the, the, the nuts and bolts of what's really happening in our backyard. And of course, what's coming out of here, Phil, is mm. absolutely amazing. It's good. It's good. absolutely amazing. So get yourselves down here, guys. It's worth coming to see Phil um, <laughs> and his team. Uh, how many have you got in your team? Maybe, there's, yeah. there's five of yeah, us. Five of us. So that all happens in that shed there? Uh, this, yes, yeah. in that little shed that's there. That's a special place where it all that's happens. That's it, that's where the, that's the alchemy happens. Is that, is, that, is that a secret shed or can we have a little visit in well, there? We can a have a little, little yeah. look inside. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure our next little bit, we're gonna have a little look inside of what's going on. But out here, look at that view you couldn't get that anywhere else you know um it's just absolutely superb and uh, it's been a pleasure actually coming down here seeing this mm. honestly that feels great uh, actually here so, so uh chardonnay here you, you got no nope. this uh, this vineyard was planted by the two brothers in 93. oh not okay and yeah. at that time they were drawing influences people were, yeah. were drinking an abomination called leap milch you're too young to remember no, I, of course yeah <laughs> I've, I've never remember that no of course yeah so they thought in yeah, the yeah. Eight, 880s they might yeah. plant germanic style grapes so yeah. this variety is called russian Steiner. Oh, okay. And further up, so we've got another German, yeah, yeah. German yeah, white yeah. called Huxelrieber, yeah. and they actually make pretty serviceable wines. Oh, okay. Now, when they ripen, we make them into still wine. When they right. don't ripen, we make them into sparkling wine. Oh, okay. So That's interesting. Again, yeah. nature is yeah. leading the wine styles that yeah, we make. Yeah, yeah. Um, and further yeah. down there, there used to be a variety called Rondo, originated yeah. in China. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, we've grubbed that up in the last year or so. We planted exclusively Pinot Noir. Right, okay. If you, yeah. don't, if you told me eight years ago that we could ripen Pinot Noir here, I wouldn't have believed you. Oh. So now we can. Yeah. So yeah. We've, we're making, we started yeah. making still red Pinot Noir. Oh, okay. And that's going to yeah. be our future. Yeah. Yeah, because you see the age here now, don't we? You just, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The, the, the maturity yeah. and the weather is with us. So uh, is that over the far back there? So your... you can see uh, there's a metal pole up there. Yeah. That's halfway. Oh, okay. And so yeah. but that's the, that's what you're looking at there is Chardonnay at the end. Right, okay. And that goes back. Up to... And your Pinot Noir is, is that? Uh, there's there's some there, that size, some yeah. here. Okay. Um, yeah, there's, there's several yeah, blocks yeah, of yeah. Pinot Noir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we've planted Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Bacchus. And Bacchus, yeah. yeah. So German. Um, yeah. Great. Well, that's, look, that's fantastic. Um, we're now we're going to we're going to have a little look um, in that secret shed over there. <laughs> um, well, I'm sure it all happens, Bill. Uh, so we'll see you in a bit. Okay, we're back. So we're we're in the uh, in the shed, but the wine making uh, room uh, with Phil, and you're going to take us uh, into the back here and. Uh, We'll see what's uh, what's really going on. So here we have what we call a grape reception area, and a hoist for crushing and uh, the, the, the white grapes when we're making still white wine. We have a half a ton press. The half a ton press was bought it's uh, Wilms from Germany by a gentleman up the road um, in 1974. He ran it for 20 years. When his business closed, the two chaps that opened this business acquired it in 1993 and my wife and I acquired it ourselves in 2012. And this is a, like a, a tube with a big white mesh in it, around it, and in the middle is a great big German balloon. And what we do with this German balloon is we blow it up. The English love blowing up a German balloon. Yeah. So we put half a ton yeah. of grapes in there and uh, we attach a compressor and we blow up the balloon. And these gates are closed down so we can spin the machine around. So the grapes around squirt, and, yeah. The grapes do squirt through these little holes oh, okay. into, the into the tray and yeah. yeah. pumped into the winery. Right. And this is very gentle and we can use it for red wine, yeah, yeah. white wine yeah. um, and sparkling wine. And the sparkling wine is just whole berries. Um, we, don't put, we don't crush them in any way. And the first juice that comes out we discard, we don't use. 
um, then we have a bit in the middle which we take and yeah. then a bit at the end we don't use oh, okay. it's a very gentle process yeah. to get the best proteins out of the out of the wine so one of the reasons that why English sparkling wine is a little bit more expensive mm. is because we're actually using tiny little bunches called Pinot Noir. You've got big bunches of Chardonnay, mm. Pinot Noir's tiny, and you're only pressing very gently and taking some of the juice. The right. rest you discard. So you're sort of losing quite a lot, really. You lose some but, volume. But grabbing all, all the you're best going, parts. You're aiming for right. the premium quality, yeah. and that's why it's... The hence why it's a little bit more expensive, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah necessarily so. Yeah. And uh, the thing is about this um, nation is we're a high tax wine making nation, yes. uh, three pounds 30 duty on a bottle yes. of wine, yeah. uh, sparkling wine plus VAT on top yeah. of that. So um, we, up, yeah. we are, the object is to be super premium yeah. and uh, that's the perception of the English around the world is yeah. we're a premium nation yeah. and that fits very well with the kind of products that we can produce. Oh absolutely, yeah, and it's all about premium products, you know, our mm. products, very premium, mm. you know, and the wine inside, obviously, especially English, is unbelievable. Isn't it? It's good. So over here then, uh, explain to people who have never seen this before, so um, this is, what actually goes on here? This is called a riddling device, and uh, what we're doing here is we're getting the yeast out of the bottle. The yeast uh, sits in cages for three years, waiting for the yeast to break down, and that uh, imparts extra proteins into the wine to make mm. a final mousse on the palate. Mm. Um, after three years, it's like a powder at the bottom of the bottle, and we put them in here, and every day we come to the office, there's a program of different turns in different ways, yeah. and today it's a quarter of a turn and a knock. And the next one, a quarter of a turn, and a knock, and the next one, a quarter of a turn, and a knock. And we follow that program for about 20 days, gradually inverting the bottles right. until the yeast slips down to the tip. And when we can see that the yeast is now compacted at the bottom, we can then stand them on their, on their tip for a bit, and then we get a, a bath out, which goes down to minus 30. We drop that bit into the bath, and that bit freezes. So we now have the yeast caught in a nice plug. At that point, we can take the cap off, bang, out flies the yeast. Oh. These are attributed to yeah. Madame Clicquot or Verve Clicquot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the early days, Don Perignon is accredited as making some sparkling wine. 35 years after the English invented it, he had some Ver Anglais shipped down to Champagne and gave it a go himself. But before these were invented by Madame Clicquot, upending her dining room table, they used to do this in boxes of sand. Oh, really? Mm. I didn't know that, yeah. Mm. I mean, I did try this earlier on, actually, and uh, I got the angle slightly wrong. So I'm not <laughs> even going to attempt it again. I'm going to leave that to the experts, but um, yeah, that's interesting, you know, yeah. I've sort of known a little bit about this, yes. but for a lot of people out there, you don't really actually realise what actually goes on to get that sort of glass of wine that you're having in your garden yeah. on a beautiful day like today. So after this then, uh, Phil, what happens after this? Where, so where after you? pressing, uh, we, yeah. we go into the fermenting room. Here we have capacity to make about uh, 25,000 bottles. You can never make the full capacity because you have to move wine from yeah. one tank to an empty tank. So you have to have some empty ones. So is that your average? Uh, uh, 20,000. 20,000 per year. year. Yeah. Yeah. You typically yeah. half sparkling, half still. Yeah. And we may make four still wines and yeah. two sparklings yeah. typically. So that's quite, that's quite a nice amount to keep, you yeah. know, and to, yeah. to work with, isn't it, over the, over yeah. the year? Yeah. yeah, definitely. I must say, it is, it's absolutely beautiful and cool in here, it isn't is it? Cool. Yeah. Out there is baking, coming in here, it's like, oh, yeah. beautiful. But yeah, yeah, it's great to see actually, yeah. And uh, we'll be working very, very hard soon then. It will, it all this is going yeah. to be cleared out yeah. and prepared for harvest, yeah. which starts at the, we're about 10 days advanced to where we mm. normally would be because mm. of the lovely weather. Yeah, so we'll yeah. be harvesting probably the second to last weekend of September we will start. And then we start to pick the, um, sparkling grapes first when the acids are higher and the sugars are lower. Oh, okay. um, so we start yeah, with yeah. sparkling wine. Uh, except for the Chardonnay, it takes a long time to ripen, so we let that hang yeah. for another month. Yeah. Um, and the still wines happen in the beginning of October typically. So this year, we've had a fantastic year yeah. for weather. Do you think this year is going to be a, a good year? It's going to be a very good year. It's you know, when the time of harvest and it gets into the bottle, you know, yeah. it's going to be a, this year is going to be a fantastic year to write about and to, it is. And to drink, obviously. But it know. may not be yeah. as good as the best year ever, which was 2018. Oh, so but, yes, yeah. Fabulous, but yeah. We're, we're working yeah. towards a, a, a yeah. looking like it's looking pretty looking good pretty right good, now. Yeah. Now, we could all go wrong, nobody knows. August could be wet all the time. But yeah. at the moment, yeah. We've passed certain milestones. We, we the leaves came early, and we mm. didn't have any frost here. Which no is frost a, at all. Yeah. The reason that this yeah. vineyard is here yeah. is we don't get frost. Five yeah. miles inland, they get frost. Yes, I know. There's a lot of people suffer from this and start yes. fires and try and keep that they frost do. down. Don't yeah. know we don't be. have that problem. But yeah, you're, you're you're in this sort of like micro part. Well, it's, it's the influence of the sea, yeah. which is only four miles on three yeah. sides. So, so 
passes um, over. It, the yeah, maritime yeah. influence just keeps us slightly, yeah. slightly higher. Yeah. Um, and then also with the, the on the um, two days ago we hit Baraton, so the berries started changing colour. Now that's the second earliest in the history of this vineyard. Wow. That, that, that's happened. That's happened really. So that again yeah. is another indication that we're heading. So the second time in what 16, 16? Well, the vineyard's been here twenty eight years. Oh, twenty eight years. But you've yeah. had it obviously 16, 17 years. We've, yeah. we've had it for nearly, nearly ten years. Only oh, ten years. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah. in all of that time, wow. this is the second earliest this ever happened. Wow, well, that is. And that, that's a good milestone that's to good. hear. That's good. Well, look, I, I think you know we've. Uh, I'm going to stay in here now. You yeah. lot can go. I'm going to stay in the cold. But um, we're going to come out of here oh. and uh, and see where we, we go next, Bill. Okay. So this is one of our stores, and uh, there's about uh, ten thousand bottles in there at the moment. Wow. Sometimes it goes up yeah. to twelve, fourteen thousand. But uh, we're gradually eating through the stock that we have. It's been a good year, very successful year for the business this year. And we're selling a lot of bottles. Mm. Mm. Uh, another record month this month, which is nice to be able to say. Uh, yeah, that's what I like to see. You know, uh, a seller. Mm. Uh, literally fall to the brim. Yeah, you know, and it's fantastic. Yep. So this yeah. this has got a lot of bottles in it, ten thousand yeah. bottles, and we call that a thermal mass. To change that uh, temperature it takes a lot of energy, it will do, and yeah. so it, yeah. it sits at fourteen degrees. Right. So and yeah. that's that it stays like and that's that. That's stable. We've got nothing else no, doing that. It's no, just it's just the thermal so, mass of like, those bottles. So a bit like how our cellars work. Mm. That thermal mass with a mm. bit of passive flow. Yeah. That's all helping that's, that. That's all to, it needs to yep. mature. It settles at 14 yeah. degrees and it's difficult to get it to change. Yeah. That uh, is pretty unbelievable, really. And uh, it's natural. You know, yeah. It's great. So, in there, we had yeah. wines going back as, as far as 2014, and we'll taste a bit of 2014 red. We've just released. Mm. I feel that is a wine that's going to benefit for another uh, 10 to 20 years cellaring. Um, and I'll explain why a little later why we made it to be that way. Yeah. Well, that'd be good. Yeah, it'd be good to have a little taste of that. Yeah. I must admit. But uh, anyway, so we're 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 done in here now, Phil. Are we? Yes, we're done, done here. Uh, fascinating. Um, so we're now gonna sort of uh, say goodbye for a little minute, and we'll come back in a little while with uh, the next part. Shit. Okay. So we're opening up a bottle of a wine called Kent Classic. This is made from a variety called Huxelrieber, originated in Germany. Not many places have this variety in the UK. Oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> But, um, so even the experts uh, can cork it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm always doing that. It's normally after use, a few drinks. We only use corks. Now these corks are, yeah. are called TCA free, which means we don't get cork taint. Yeah, and, and there's this massive debate, isn't there? It always has been you know, between the cork screw, you know, the screw, and, screw and, and, mm. and you know, and the, and obviously the cork. You know, what, what's your take on that? Well, um, uh, there, so there, there theory, was though. an advantage for wines that are going to be drunk young yeah. uh, to be hermetically sealed with a wax uh, paper mm. cap, um, and that gave them an advantage, especially with the entree, because the, the kids of the serving could take the cap off, pour a glass, put the cap back on. Yeah, and done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A cork, but uh, before we obviously had uh, control issues with the cork, depending on the individual characteristics of that individual cork. But these corks, made by Diam, a significant new advantage of control. So not only are they free of TCA, which gives you cork taint, mm. but they're also uh, graded for oxygen transfer. So depending on the perception of the winemaker, how long the wines are going to need, you buy a different cork for a different oxygen transfer rate or a different length. To oh, okay, them. yeah. So you can change the headspace yeah. in the bottle. Okay, yeah, that makes sense actually. So this wine is, is drinking well now. Um, it's 2018, any English wine with 2018 on it is gonna be good. Um, this one was an exceptional uh, year um, but it's going to really, the flavour because the molecules in there are really going to coalesce around about 2025 to 2030 and that's the optimum drinking for this particular wine. So on this you should get tropical notes, mango and guava with a twist of lime on top. Oh yeah, you got, you can... It will become Sorry, so much more golden, unctuous, a fuller mouthfeel over the years. Oh, that is nice. Can't have too much, obviously, some driving. Mm. That is very nice. Mm. Yeah, very good. A good wine for the summer drinking. Yeah, I must say that is um, that's up there, actually, guys. Yeah. So uh, where are we feel this one? Yeah, this one here. So um, and this is the benefit of a uh, you know the smaller hectares that you've got. Mm. You can you can swap and change and yeah. and you can. That was Gannett was saying earlier on about the wines, you can swap. You yes, know, we over, we're not, we're not know. driven to make one wine, yeah. we're not known for a wine. Yeah. The object is to get people to enjoy the different wines that we make mm. and come along and in every year and say, what's good this year? 
yeah. why is it good? What made yeah. it good? And, yeah. Um, yeah. and we're led by. I suppose a bit of a surprise as well. Yeah, what, what are you doing this year? Because yeah. you know, instead of you know for the, the big you know the big guys mm. who make the same thing every year, they do. You know, uh, say Bacchus every year. You know, mm. but someone like yourself, it's actually you're. you're Oh, I wonder what Phil's doing this year. Yes, Just exactly get down so. there, you know, yeah. and it's yeah. and you can explain the story, yes. you know, which we're doing today. Uh, it's fantastic. Well, look, this is uh, it's been a fantastic um, day, morning, whatever it is, afternoon now. God, it's been a fantastic afternoon uh, down here, Phil. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Cheers. And um, <laughs> we'll definitely be down here again, not videoing, but down here probably more on the social side. Uh, but yeah, thanks very much, Phil. It's been a pleasure on our uh, first tour. Uh, and it's in Kent, and it's in my back garden almost, so uh, fantastic. Thank so you. cheers, thank you very much. Okay, so we just tried the uh, the white, uh, which I said everyone is fantastic. Now Phil, um, red wine, mm. British red wine. Yep. It's, uh, it's um, always has this, you know, is it good? You know, what's happening? Mm. When are we gonna be having some, you know, up against that mm. in France and Italy? Oh, how far away are we, do you think, we're, from we're, getting we're... to that? that it happens point, to be the case. But the French are going to say, oh, you've got fantastic red wine now. Yeah. Is that ever going to happen? Yeah, it is going to happen, and it's, it's yeah. starting to happen, but it, it's hit and miss. Yeah. The uh, probability of making a great red is low, but it can be done. Now, the, the, the truth of it is, is that Pinot Noir can be grown successfully in a hot place like the south of France. Yeah. Not a problem. But it doesn't manifest in an interesting way. In the north, where they grow Pinot Noir, where it just about ripens, mm. it just about ripens. It's important that then you get... Um, an extremely interesting um, expression of Pinot Noir, but it's got to be cool. Now that zone is now here, and so we'll be making world-leading Pinot Noirs anytime soon, I can guarantee wow. it. Uh, yeah. But this is a vestige of what English wine used to be. And this is a variety called Rondo, originated in China 80 years ago. Um, this was made on a, what we would call an average year, and what that makes at best is an average English red wine. Now this wine, 2014, was an extraordinary autumn and the, it stayed extremely dry the berries didn't swell with the moisture so when the grapes came in they were perfectly clean but not too many of them so what we do is um, with this we had the skins the pips floating together for 12 days with these beautiful ripe grapes 35 days and what we've done is over extracted a lot of that complex fruit flavor that was in there and a lot of the bitterness that came out of the pip is in there as well the tannins now the french would typically crack in an egg but my, uh, that will soften the tannins. But my philosophy is don't touch anything, don't add anything, especially, oh, so leave it. especially animal products, definitely not. Right. So we, we just, we didn't filter it, and we put it into the bottle in, in uh, five years ago and left it in the cellar. Because what we know is over the years, this bitter compound tannin is gonna lock onto a color pigment, and it's gonna move from the violet towards the tawny as it ages and the color falls out, and the tannin is falling out with it, so the bitterness is going down. But over the years, those front fruit complex, complex fruit molecules will start coalescing and improving, which is the principle of aging red wine. So this red wine has been over-extracted, over-oaked, unfiltered, all of that goodness in a bottle, and the intention is to be drinking this in 2030 to 2040. That's the drinking curve. Right, so that's now, your lane now. Time yeah. It's softened a bit now, yeah. and it, it would probably need a bit of red meat to take away some of those tannins, tannins yeah. Um, yeah. which is fine, and it's yeah. but it's developing the complexity that I foresaw, um, and it's going to be a great yeah. wine in years to come. Now, this doesn't happen very often in England. So I need to get, I need to buy uh, a case of this and put it into my yep. cellar. Yeah. Guys, if you're around, buy a case of this, uh, put it into your cellar. Uh, be great if it's one of ours. Um, and 2030-ish, you think? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's 2025. It's really going to start coming in. Yeah. But you know, 2030 to 2040, you've yeah, got big, something. Yeah. I don't know anybody that's made a wine to age like that in this country. Wow, well, that is amazing. Well, let's have a little taste, Bill, shall we? And um... so it's lost a bit of its violet colour over the years. As there will be a little bit of sediment in here. We big, use yeah. a bottle with a, with a pump at the bottom to catch some sediment and a Bordeaux bottle has a bulge here to collect any sediment as it falls. But this particular wine would benefit from the, the use of a decanter. That's not quite smooth actually, is it? It's not bad. It's still a little bit, needs a bit more integration. Yeah, you can just um, tell. You can with time. Yeah. But Spitting. Um, they tend to do that because it tastes so good. Um, that is lovely, Phil. Mm. Thanks for the history on that. Um, so, 
So I think we definitely need to be buying some of that um, now. Yeah. And uh, put it in your cellar and lay that down to 25 to 30. It's going to yeah. be, uh, be great to see what that tastes like. Yeah. Uh, I'll be a little bit older, obviously. You know. <laughs> um, Grey hair still be there, you know. Yeah. You've got a few years. <laughs> I've got a few years, yeah. Well, look, thanks for that, Phil. That's brilliant stuff. And uh, we'll catch up uh, in a little while. Thanks. Cheers. Right, well, that's, uh, that's the end of our first tour here at Barnes Hole Vineyard. You can see the beautiful vines in the background there. Um, we've obviously picked probably the best day to come down here. Um, so many thanks to Phil for uh, letting us come down and uh, everything he's told us about the industry and what he's doing here. And that's really what we wanted to know. We wanted to find out what's happening in the small vineyards up against the big guys um, in my backyard. So uh, thanks for Phil for that. Anyway, that's our first talk. We're done. We're off. Uh, where are we going next? I can't remember now. Um, somewhere in Kent probably. Uh, but that's next week. So uh, I'm going to sign out and uh, have a fantastic weekend. Cheers.